from the meadows in Wickenburg, Arizona, where recovery is a way of life. Join us now for a talk by Pia Melody. Well, good afternoon. Well, thank you. <laughs> the, uh, the tape I'm going to do now, or the lecture, I originally proposed as healthy relationships, and, and then I decided I probably couldn't do that. And so I changed it to human relationships, which I probably could do. I have a tendency in my cynical way to want to call healthy re the, the concept healthy relationships an oxymoron, and that healthy and relationships don't fit. But of course, that's not true. That only reflects my cynicism. But uh, I get conflicted about how to talk about relationships, because it's very easy to describe an ideal. And the trouble with that is, when you listen to that kind of thing, it leads to you being disappointed when you experience your very human relationship. I believe a relationship happens whenever there's intimacy between two people. So whenever you make a decision to be physically, sexually, intellectually, or emotionally intimate with somebody, you are making a choice to be in relationship. Now, the issue here, I think, really is that in that exchange of intimacy, it can be healthy or unhealthy, or it can be toxic, or it can be healthy, or it can be functional or dysfunctional. There's lots of words you can use for that. But basically, in my mind, when I think about whether, relation, uh, whether an intimate moment is functional or not, I think about whether as a result of the interaction, are the people closer together? Are they about where they started out? Or are they farther apart? Now, I think an interaction, when an interaction happens and people start moving back and away, because indeed in the exchange there's been offending behavior, or because of issues of immaturity, someone or both in the partnership just simply can't stand to hear the truth. Then, then you have something going um, that I think is destructive to the relationship whenever you're stepping back. It's nice, of course, if you move forward. Um, if you stay right where you are, I think that's okay too, unless you start out here and you don't move forward. But basically, I think what's important to look at is where you're standing at the end of that experience. Now, intimacy is a real interesting concept. And basically, it's about releasing your reality towards somebody in some way or taking their reality in. In other words, I can be intimate using my own body and moving towards somebody physically or sexually, or I can also receive somebody else's body physically and or sexually. Same thing with thoughts. I can speak to my thoughts or listen to somebody else's thoughts. I can share my emotions or listen to somebody else's emotions. The other thing, too, is I can simply just watch somebody. I can watch their behavior or allow somebody to watch me. All that, to me, is about being intimate. Now, the funny thing about intimacy is that it's hard to do. For us humans, it's actually in some ways hard to do because it's about one's capacity to be vulnerable. One's capacity to be vulnerable or to be alone, or to, excuse me, to be known. See, the thing with that is, when you're talking about vulnerability, what we have to deal with when we're letting ourselves be known is, is somebody else's reaction to our issues of humanity or imperfection. If we have not come to accept our own issues of humanity, then we're probably going to uh, really hide the true nature of ourselves in some way from the other person and retard the relationship or the in in intimate exchange. See, self-love really does enable you to make yourself vulnerable, to be known. Intimacy is also about one's capacity to give up control. 
of the situation to a certain extent, not complete control because then you'd probably be in boundary failure. But certainly to give up control at some level or to surrender to what is. Now, since you a lot of times can't predict what's going to happen, those of us who, who have had experience not knowing what's going to happen and then something dreadful happened, will have difficulty taking the chance of letting what happened happen without trying to control it. So if we immediately try to start controlling it, the moment of intimacy will, it, unless it's about setting boundaries, the moment of intimacy will be spoiled because if you're attempting to control somebody else's reality, you are acting in an unloving way, unless it's a statement about boundaries. Uh, like, for example, you're touching me this way, it's hurting me, please stop touching. That's not controlling the other person, that's setting your boundaries. But if in the intimate exchange you demand that another human being be a an absolute way, so they're not free to be themselves as long as they're not violating your boundaries, what you do is you retard their ability to be who they are, or their desire anyway, to be with you. So it's about one's capacity to surrender to what is. It's also about one's capacity to be honest with self and others, which is directly related back to the self-esteem issue. It's directly related, and it's about one's capacity to tell the truth and stand somebody knowing the truth. You know, I've discovered about that in, in my relationships, especially with Pat, is that he more easily deals with me when I tell the truth. Now, I don't lie, but what I will do is not mention everything. <laughs> now, you could call that manipulation. Of course, I think there's an issue about being political within relationships. In other words, there are times when it's not in your best interest or in the relationship's long-term best interest to be revealing everything. There's, there's something about understanding how to do that. But anyway, what I, what I noticed in my relationship with Pat is that when I'm wanting to really hang on to something and not let him know about it, he does much better with it if I just tell him and not defend myself around that. I'll, if I just say, this is the way it is for me, and then boundary myself and, 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 and allow him the space to have his reaction to that or whatever, if I allow that to happen instead of worrying about what may and then holding it, if I allow it to happen, he does pretty well with it. He, if, he's, uh, if he has upset himself about it, if I don't interfere with any of that, I just watch him. Not like a bug, but, you know, with love in my heart. He gets almost immediately over it if he's in disagreement. He doesn't hang on to it. So when I let it go, I notice he lets it go, too. Kind of works that way. And being intimate, these are all kind of interrelated, actually, is about one's capacity to reach out or risk rejection. I think we have to be able to uh, be rejected at some level in order to be in, a, in, in what I would call a mature relationship. So these things aren't easy. Most of us do not get help, the help we need to be in healthy relationships in the first place. Nobody's fault, I don't think. It's just the way it is. And relationships, and the nature of relationships, the, the values around relationships have really been changing over the last 50 years. And so we're kind of operating without any real fixed rules about it, which makes it harder to do. So what I had to do in order to make decisions as to uh, how I was going to behave in a relationship is I focused myself around first getting into right relationship with me by learning to love myself, by focusing on having good boundaries with other people, as, and, which means I protected myself and I contained myself. That I focused on being true to myself and giving some consideration to what I let out and what I uh, kept in about myself. And I focused on probably more, really, this is really important in relationships, 
I started to focus on active self-care so that I wasn't so dependent. And then I, then I started to uh, work on asking for help when I needed help and only when I needed help. And, I, and in doing that, I had to also work on um, being, being willing to hear a no when I asked for help and Pat wasn't in a position to help me or somebody else who I was in relationship with. In other words, I not only had to learn to ask for help, which is interdependence, I had to learn to have an attitude about it that, that was what my sponsor used to tell me is celebrating the no. I had to be willing to hear a no from him with an attitude of, if I hear a no from my partner, it's because he or she believes that it's in his or her best interest to do so, and that a no to me isn't rejection. It's not my partner wants to do something else. I had to work on that. I also had to work on being available to, um, to give help to another. Now that's not easy. I used to do anything anybody asked me to do, you know, within reason. And I never considered that I should not give over, so to speak, if it, if it was at too great a cost to me or if it made me feel like a victim. I learned, I had to learn to discipline myself so when somebody asked something of me that I made a decision to think first, hey, can I do this without too great a cost to me? Can I do this without feeling like a victim and developing resentments? If the answer was yes, I'd do it. The third question I had to learn to ask myself was can I do this without enabling this other person? If I'm doing something for them which they need to be doing for themselves, I'm enabling. So I had to learn to ask three questions, you know, like that, very rapidly when somebody came and asked something of me. So I had to focus on these kind of, kinds of issues, which are around the first four primary symptoms. And the last thing I had to learn to do is to be moderate in all things. That was about many things, actually. That was learning how to contain myself in balance, not containing myself too tight, so I was uptight and miserable and humped over and exhausted. And also, not too loosely, so that I had a tendency to um, put too much energy in somebody's face. But in addition to that, I had to stop such black and white thinking. Right, wrong, good, bad. Um, there is an answer and this is it sort of attitude. I had to, in many areas of my life, learn to see that there are many solutions that all are solutions, that there is no right or wrong answer most of the time. I had to learn to think like that, and I had to learn how to contain myself better. What is critical to really enabling a relationship to work well, I think, begins with good boundaries. If you have your personal boundaries intact from the standpoint of protecting yourself and containing yourself both, what will happen is that you will reduce inside the relation, inside the relationship, the amount of victimization that goes on. And that's critical. That's one issue. But the second issue is when you have good personal boundaries, you are able to in intimate exchange, really see the other person as well as know the self enough to be able to share that. So boundaries are critical to mature or healthy or human relationships. The other thing I think that's very important to human relationships is the ability to steam the self. See, what people are look what most people are looking for in relationship is to be allowed to be who they are. That's what we all look for. And I think another individual has the right to be who they are within the relationship as long as they're not violating your boundaries. They, most people want to be affirmed when they're being who they are as long as it's not a boundary violation. They want to be affirmed in that. And one thing I noticed is that until I learn to esteem myself, give myself permission to be who I am, as long as it's not a boundary violation, 
And until I learned to engage in active self-care, I was unable to allow anybody in relationship with me to be who they wanted to be when it didn't take care of me or didn't esteem me. See, those, those primary symptoms really deeply not only affect the rela- are about the relationship with self, Inevitably, if you've not managed them well, they will absolutely infect the relationship. In other words, if you don't self-love, you will not be able to love another human being and allow them to be who they are. If you don't have good boundaries, there's going to be a lot of offender issues going on in relationship. Whenever there's an offender issue, automatically there'll be a self-esteem problem and a power issue. Resentments, a lot of toxic energy. If you don't own your own reality, you have nothing to share in relationship and your partner will experience you as empty and boring. If you don't actively self-care, then you are going to be a huge drag. You're going to be the kind of person in relationship that hangs and whines like that. On the other hand, if you're anti-dependent, which is the other extreme in the illness, your partner will have the experience of not being important to the relationship. They'll be saying, why am I here? Nothing's happening in terms of me being able to give equal energy back into the relationship. This is all either I get or forget it. Sometimes it's I get nothing, I'm not to give anything to. So you have